further evidence for the defense? Yes, Your Honor. At this point, the defense would call Nathaniel Carroll to the stand. Um, um, good morning, Mr. Carroll. If you could um, please once again tell the jury your name. Good morning. My name is Nathaniel Carroll. And how old are you? 52. And how are you related to, um, remind us how you related to Nate. That's my son. And do you live, where do you live? Roseville, North Carolina. How long have you lived in Wake County? All um, my life. And how long have you lived where you in Roseville? Probably 16 years. Um, how old were you when Nate was born? 18, 19, somewhere around there. Do you remember how old? Um, and who's his mother? Antoinette Holden. And Goldie. what do you, And what do you and what do you call Nate? Little Nate. Little Nate. So I'll probably refer to him that that the testimony. Um, how old was she when um, when little Nate was born? Fifteen, sixteen, somewhere around there. Okay. How did you meet her? In the neighborhood. Um, was she someone that you went to school with? No, sir. Okay. You just saw her around the neighborhood. Yes, sir. Um. How did your family react when she became pregnant with little Nate? My family? Yeah. They was fine with it. What about her family? <clears throat> they didn't like it at all. So who did she end up staying with during her pregnancy? Me and my mother. Um, and did she continue to stay with you after um, little Nate was born? Yes, sir. Um, were you two ever married? No, sir. How long did you stay together? Up until good night, about 18 years old. Okay. I'm going to ask you some questions about um, Goldie's um, use of substances. Did she drink? Yes, sir. You said you met her when... Well, did she drink when she, um, when you first met her? Yes, sir. Even though she was a young teenager at that time? Yes, sir. Um, did she also do any other types of drugs at that time? Smoke weed. What about when, when um, she was pregnant with Nate? Not that I know of. As she continued to live with you, you, did her drinking increase? Yes, sir. Can you describe that? Well, as she said, she tried to sneak and drink. And you know how that goes. You get probably tore up quicker trying to sneak and do so. So she continued to drink. What about you? Were you drinking at that time? I drank a couple of beers, yes, sir. Okay. Were you drinking as much as she was? No, sir. Okay. When she had been drinking, did the two of you ever get into fights? Yes, sir. What would happen in those fights? Well, if I go ahead and leave, maybe everything was all right. But if I stay there, she drinking and I'm drinking, it didn't get no better. Would these fights involve hitting? Yes, sir. Would she hit you? Yes, sir. Would you hit her? Yes, sir. Did she ever get bruising as a result of the, your hitting with her? Did I get bruised? Did she get bruised? Yes, sir, she did. Throughout your relationship, how often did this happen? 
pretty much the whole relationship. On a regular basis? I wouldn't really say regular basis, but pretty much, you know, she she drunk, always drinking. When she was drinking, that was the problem. That was the problem. And when she was drinking, you two would fight? Yes, sir. During the course of your relationship, did you have relationships with other women? Yes, sir. Was that sometimes the cause of these arguments? Well, they hope the situation out, be able to go and talk with someone else. So you would, so you would go, and so would Goldie be upset about the fact that you had relationships with other women? Yes, sir. Okay. And sometimes that's what led to these fights. Well, after a while it did. She used that for an excuse of start with she accepted what I had done for us, the two kids I had on the outside. And then when she, as years went on by, she used that for an excuse for what she was doing because I had had kids on the outside. Okay. You said you had kids. How many kids did you have on the outside? Two. Um, who are those kids? Nathaniel, Jamal, Carol, Katina, S. Rainey. Were they, did they have two different parent mothers? Yes, sir. Okay. So you have three children and they have three different mothers? Yes, sir. Um, did she ever go from drinking to using other drugs? Yes, sir. What other types of drugs did she start using? Crack cocaine. You remember about when she started doing that? Not really exactly, but I believe around the night in high school, in his high school years. Okay. Did the two of you eventually break up? Yes, sir. Why did you break up? Fighting, just couldn't get along, fighting. So we just decided to let go. Um, did a little Nate um, graduate from high school? Yes, sir. Did you attend that graduation? Yes, sir. Did his mother? No, sir. Could you tell us about that? She didn't attend and he cried up some that day of the graduation. I couldn't figure out why. Never know to a couple of years back, he told me the reason why, because she wasn't there. She did not attend it. Talk a little bit about your son. What sorts of things um, did he do for a living? Cut hair. He worked with a company called Store and drove a cab. For the school. Was he always trying to, was he always working? Yes, sir. Do you remember a time in 2009 when his house was broken into? Yes, sir. What do you remember about that? He called me and told me that uh, his house was broken into. So I was right in the neighborhood. I went on over. And I asked, was he all right before I got there? I thought the house was just broken into. I didn't think that he was physical beating or nothing before I got there. So when I got there, I walked in and I looked at him and he had been beaten. He turned around and started crying. Did he say how many people beat him up? Four people. Did he go to the hospital? Yes, sir. I rode with him on ambulance. Did he seem any different after that? Yes, he did. In what way? He was more paranoid and just a difference. As a matter you... of fact, after that, they moved out the home. They were scared. They called me a couple nights after that and said uh, the house next door then was being robbed. Objection. Non-responsive. Move. Sorry. And disregard that answer, just 
uh, answer the questions you're asked, sir. <coughs> All right. Do you love your son? Yes, sir. Does your son love you? Yes, sir. And if he were to get a life sentence, would you be able to see him on a regular basis? Yes, sir. And would that be important to you? Yes, sir. And would that be important to the other members of his family? Yes, sir. Thank you. That's all the questions I have. <laughs> Cross-examination, Mr. Lava. Yes, sir. Um, Mr. Carroll, did you and um, Antoinette or Goldie um, provide for the defendant as he was growing up? Yes, sir. That is, I mean, he had all the clothes he needed, all the food he needed. Um, shelter and yes, uh, sir. got him to school, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and you say you say he was always working, but I've heard other testimony that. Do you mean he was working at home with the kids, or he was out? Pretty much, biggest of the time he was at home with the kids because he was cutting hair. And then he drove the cab, and he was in the mornings, in the evenings, and back at home. Now, you were uh, asked about the uh, assault in 2009. Uh, he called you, is that right? Yes, sir. All right. And you went over there, and he was crying and told you four people had beaten him up? Yes, sir. And you went with them to the um, hospital and ambulance? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, did he provide details to you about who these people were, why the house was broken into? He really didn't know who the people were. So he didn't. He couldn't figure out really who they was. Were you aware uh, as to whether or not he he might have been selling marijuana at that time? No, I was always talking to him about cutting hair at home, and you know, people in the neighborhood. I already figured he had money because he was cutting hair at home, getting paid at home. So. Okay. Okay. So so you you weren't aware of any drug dealing at that point. No, sir. Uh, did y'all call the police and report the incident? Yes, sir. Was it, it anything ever come of it? Not that I know of. Because what took action afterwards. Uh, you never had to go to court and testify no, in a trial? No, sir. <laughs> After the assault in 2009, you say he was more paranoid, but was he still able to care for his family and do the work that he needed to do? Yes, sir. All right. And on um, January 26th of 2014, um, you were there at that the, the drop-off of the, ch the custody exchange between uh, the defendant and Sylvester Taylor. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and after Mr. Taylor left, um, was there some discussion about going over to his house between the defendant and Jamal? No, sir. Not after he left, no, sir. But at, at some other time? Well, Jeremy called. Right. After the fact, after Jeremy called, they wanted to go over there. Okay. And there's three of us was together. And and did y'all talk about, talk about it and then a decision was made that the defendant agreed with to not go over there? Did we talk about it? Me, little Nate, and... And Jamal. That's right. Yes, we did talk about it. Okay. I mean, um, but you ultimately didn't go, is that right? No, I did not go with them. They left and said they was going, but they didn't ever go. That I found out later on, they didn't ever go. All right. So, uh, so <coughs> after hearing about this, they considered it and then didn't go. Right, because they wanted me to go, and I said it wasn't the right thing to do. So yes, sir. I didn't go. Thank you. Nothing further. <coughs> Redirect. Um, just to clarify, um, when little Nate was cutting hair, he would do it out of his home? Yes, sir. But he, had a, he was a licensed barber, though. Yes, sir. That's all I have. Anything further? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. You may step down. I want to say something to the family. No, sir. Can't? Step down, please. Further evidence for the defense? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, we call Dr. John Blackshear.
Sir, if you would, please stand. Place your left hand on the Bible and raise your right. Do solemnly swear the testimony you give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God. Thank you. Good afternoon, Dr. Blackshear. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, will you please uh, give your full name for the record? Yeah, my name is Jr. Jr. And, uh, and what is your profession? I'm a clinical psychologist. What's your current job? Well, it's, all right, so I'll go through it all. Um, currently, I'm an academic dean at Duke University, uh, faculty in residence there, and on the faculty in psychology and neuroscience, and I teach um, forensic psychology at the university, um, and I'm a faculty in residence there, so I live at the university. And I also have a private practice. Um, it's Blackshire and Blackshire Psychological uh, Services. And there I uh, treat um, a multitude of uh, people coming in with various disorders from anxiety to uh, depression. Um, I do a lot of evaluations for uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, do those with, uh, I have a contract, several contracts to do evaluations with the uh, VA and also with people just coming in for private evaluations. And I've worked on um, uh, providing expert uh, work on capital murder cases. Um, many in New North Carolina, uh, but I've worked in Pennsylvania, uh, New York, Georgia, Florida, Alabama. So. Okay. Why don't you uh, tell us, uh, sort of take us through your, um, your educational experiences since, since high school. Or where did you go to high school? <clears throat> I went to uh, Saucy Johnson High School in Savannah, Georgia, That's where I was born and raised. And um, following that, I attended Florida A&M University where I obtained a bachelor's in psychology and a master's in clinical psych. And then after that, I attended Georgia State University where I received a PhD in clinical psychology. And following that, I did my pre-doctoral internship at the Federal Medical Center in Lexington, Kentucky. And there I did a drug treatment rotation, a general clinical rotation, and a forensic rotation. And and I became licensed here in North Carolina. I also did an externship at the University of Kentucky while I was there, uh, working as a, a clinician, uh, seeing students who had uh, severe, so I would work with the more severe uh, psychological presentations, and then moved to North Carolina, where initially I was hired on as a staff psychologist at the women's prison here in Raleigh. Um, but a couple weeks in, I got an offer to uh, start working at Duke, so I've been there since 2001. You mentioned that in your so so now you you work at Duke and you and you've worked your way up to being a uh, an academic dean is that right Yes uh, and then on, and in a, in addition to that you have a private practice Yes and how much uh, how many hours a week would you say you spend at your private practice In my private practice I, I'm there on Saturdays and so I'm usually there around 8 a.m. and I'll finish usually two or three in the afternoon so I do a lot of that work that's being done in-house then. But uh, because I do a lot of uh, consultations, I am required to travel quite a bit. So I will go at other times uh, to do the work on any cases that I, that I have to travel for. Mm -hmm. And your private practice, you said, consists of some, con some a variety of things. But one thing is uh, some contracts you have with the Veterans Administration? Yes. Can you tell us about that work? Uh, they're through. Um, QTC Medical, which is a Lockheed Martin company, and the other one is through Veterans Evaluation Services out of Texas. And these are um, companies that who sort of manage claim files for veterans. And so I've seen veterans from World War II, Vietnam, Korean War, um, many of the operations in the 80s, military sexual trauma, uh, 
the Desert Storm and Desert Shield, and more recently the Iraq and uh, Afghanistan war. And what uh, what role are you playing for these for these veterans? What types of evaluations are you doing? I'm doing um, <clears throat> some. I do general mental health, and so those are and the VA has them split out where. You're, where they, the claim is for a mental health condition that's not related to an eating disorder or PTSD. And so those can be anything from panic disorder, depression, uh, adjustment disorder, to name a few. And the uh, more specific ones for individuals who have PTSD, that's a different type of evaluation. So I'll do an initial one if it's a person's first time uh, making a claim, and then I'll do um, what we call the sort of renewal or review evaluations for people who have already had their claim and for whatever reason the VA would like this person reevaluated to determine whether or not there should be a shift in their compensation and pension. So you're so so you spend some of your time evaluating um, veterans for PTSD. Yeah. Uh, how many cases would you say you do a year? Annually for the veterans I would, I would honestly guess probably no less than about 200, 250 a year. And then in addition to the, uh, the contract work for the VA, you also have a forensic practice. Yes. And what, uh, so what does forensic psychology mean to you? Well, uh, it's best understood simply as a um, mechanism where psychology and psychiatry are uh, present relevant factors to the court through evaluation and uh, report writing and, and other gathering of data and information. And we're able to provide um, information as to whether or not a psychological, psychosocial, or cultural um, factors might have played into a case that's being presented in the legal field. So. So how many forensic cases have you worked on? In the um, past you know, 13, 14 so years that I've been doing this, um, I've worked on you know, several hundred, I know, but I've only testified in, this will be my sixth. So a lot of times those consultations do not uh, result in um, testimony because that's not, you know, part of why I'm being asked to do an evaluation. So you, uh, the other five times you testified, were you qualified as an expert in forensic psychology? Yes. Um, Your Honor, at this point, I would tender Dr. Blackshear as an expert in the field of forensic psychiatry, psychology, excuse me. Any objection? No, Your Honor. His testimony will be received as proffered. Thank you. All right, so Dr. Blackshear, um, how long have you been involved in Nate Holden's case? Uh, about a year and a half, I think it was May of 2015 is when I first uh, met with uh, Nate. Uh, so you first met him in May of 2015? Yes. Okay. And how many times have you met with him since then? Um, a total of six, uh, and the last time would have been in uh, January of this year. I can't quite remember the exact date, but. Okay. Uh, how many total hours would you say you've spent with him? Um, I would say, for, you know, face-to-face -face talking with Nate, um, about 15 total. And, <clears throat> and these visits uh, occurred while Nate was, uh, was ha being held in the Wake County Jail? Yes. Right? Do you get <laughs> contact visits with him? I do. So you were in the same room when, yes. you, when you had these meetings? Um, and what is the what is the purpose of your in-person meetings with a with a defendant in a case like this? Oh, well, it, it varies. Um, initially, uh, when I'm called as a consultant on a case, I have particular questions that uh, the attorneys have for me, and um, why, and they want me to do an evaluation to determine whether or not there are any sort of significant clinical factors involved. Um, Initially, I would really work to establish rapport, and I think um, I did that with Nate. Um, it was, it's important for a, um, a person who is uh, being charged and then is uh, being asked to sort of divulge very personal and hurtful information to me 
to be able to trust me and for us to connect. And um, and then in addition to sort of doing the evaluative things or asking questions and gathering history, um, sometimes I'm asked to just go take his temperature. You know, if, if he's upset about something and just to go in and have a conversation to help uh, sort of diffuse some of that energy. Besides, uh, so some of that time that you spent with Nate is, is for the purpose of clinical evaluation, yeah. right? And then you said that there's some, some other purposes that you might go in and meet with him as yeah. well. Um, besides, in, in reaching... Um, but, in, but may I say, though, I mean, even though that, that other time, but there's always still, I think, I treat it always still as evaluative. Um, I'm always learning and gathering information about the person I'm working with, even when I'm going into... Mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, have a different kind of conversation. Mm -hmm. Besides personally interviewing Nate, uh, what other things have you looked at in your work on this case? Oh, goodness, uh, quite a few. If, may I take out uh, my, my, um, my your laptop? Your report? Yeah. All right. Yes, go yes. ahead. All right, just take a second for this to open. So um, I reviewed <clears throat> uh, Nate's uh, Wake County Public School records, um, the dynamic, his uh, dynamic office's uh, work history, Alfred and Williams' work history records, um, and HMW office environment work history records. Oh, I'm sorry, HMW. Yeah. Um, Wake Med Emergency uh, Services records from 2010, 9, and 7. Uh, human Resources records in 2004 for, um, regarding Antoinette Holden. Um, the Wake Med Briar Creek Health Plex emergency room records regarding Antoinette Holden. Uh, human Services record regarding Nathan Holden. Uh, Monarch Services record regarding Nathan Carroll. Um, the Jay Adams interviews with Antoinette Holden, Douglas Carroll, Nathan and Sharifa Carroll, Emma Carroll, Jamal Carroll, and Katina Rainey. Um, the uh, mitigation chronology on Nathan Holden. Uh, Wake County uh, child custody files from 2014. The Wake County domestic violence protective order from 2015. Uh, Jeremy Taylor's tax log, Latanya Holden's call and tax logs, um, interviews that uh, um, Sandra Broughton Cozart uh, conducted with Vivian Ellis, Bertha Postley, Jamal Carroll, and then uh, Elizabeth Hamburger's interviews, yours with Antoinette Holden, Katina Rainey, Jackie uh, Prince. Uh, Sandra uh, Broughton Cozart's interviews with Althea and Keith Hodge, uh, Wake County Sheriff's uh, Office jail records for Nate Holden, and the CPS file B2804-4856 uh, file, and uh, Nathan Holden's personal notebooks, so all of those things. 
Uh, is, are these types of things that you've just listed, are they the types of items that you would typically re review in a, in a forensic case that you're working on? Yes, I would hope to, yeah. So are you familiar with the events that occurred on the evening of April 9th, 2014 on Lake Lad Road here in Wake County? I am. What were you asked to, to do when you were asked to, to work on this case? was to sort of uh, evaluate Nate to determine if there may be any um, psychological factors that might have been, um, I wouldn't say causative, but maybe related to why Nate uh, had committed the uh, acts that he had done on that day. Okay. And uh In, in reaching, uh, were you able to reach some conclusions of, about, about that question? Yes, I was. Did you consider, in reaching those conclusions, did you consider information about Nate's family background and childhood? I did. And how important is, is information about someone's, someone's social history to understanding uh, a, a crime <coughs> like this? Oh, I think it's critical. Uh, tell us why. Um, well, especially uh, we're, we're constantly looking at things like medical records, um, sperm childhood, if there are any, any mental health records from childhood, if there are any, and sort of social and family dynamics from childhood, because those things are occurring in formative years when um, people are developing and, you know, with the right uh, amount of intervention and care, we can oftentimes mitigate a lot of the the things that maybe someone who, in, uh, like in Nate's case, had gone through, um, and those things were absent. So it was important for me to understand um, who Nate was at, in order to be able to offer up a, I think, a valid clinical picture of uh, Nate's functioning. And were there um, particular factors that you found to be particularly important about his childhood? Um, and you don't need to go into detail about these now, but just sort of, it, were there perhaps list some of the factors that you thought were most important to your understanding of Nate? Um, yes, uh, transgenerational violence uh, in his family, uh, the lack of uh, any um, intervention early on to sort of mitigate that violence and, um, and to help Nate uh, in his formative developmental years, um, parental alcohol and drug uh, addiction, those are uh, really significant. Um, and so the uh, incredible amount of instability uh, in his uh, family of origin. Okay, let's uh, let's start talking about about some those factors and maybe some others. Um, one thing: uh, Did you find uh, any significance in uh, regarding his mother's um, cognitive abilities? Yes, I mean there was. Um, some presentation that uh, in her files that she had um, significant uh, cognitive deficits. Mm -hmm. um, and I can I can stop you there actually sure. and ask you to uh, to identify an exhibit, please. Um, okay, may I approach, Your Honor? Yes. That's exhibit S13, is that right? That the yes, S13. Yes. Okay. And these are the um, uh, background files on, uh, on Mrs. Holden, Nate's mother. Yeah. Your Honor, I've moved to admit uh, defense exhibit S13, which is the records of Antoinette Holden. Any objection? No, Your Honor. They're admitted. Uh, would you like to take a keep keep that to take a look at why sure. questions um, Okay. Um Okay. 
So, uh, in reviewing these records, what did uh, did you did you see in those records uh, um, an IQ test that had been performed on Ms. Holden? Yes. And what, what was the result of that IQ test? The IQ test indicated that uh, Ms. Holden has a verbal IQ of uh, 65, which was at the first percentile, which is uh, extremely low, a performance IQ of 85, which is at a 16th percentile, which is in the low average range. It's the lowest of the average range. It's the 16th percentile. And a uh, full-scale IQ of 72, mm -hmm. which is in the third percentile, which is a borderline um, range, and we can... The difference, I think, uh, if to be explained, so between borderline and low is the cutoff would have been a score of 70. But because of her um, performance on the um, performance IQ side, her score was brought up by the 85. So the full scale is just an average of the verbal IQ and the performance IQ. So uh, an IQ score of 70 is, is significant <clears throat> because it's the cutoff between uh, for intellectual, a diagnosis of intellectual disability, yes. is that right? And, and intellectual disability is a term that is, uh, has recently replaced the term mental retardation. Correct. Is that right? Yes. So, so, anyone, so someone with an IQ below 70 uh, would fall into the, the category of intellectual disability or mental retardation, is that right? Right. right. And on this assessment, um, that we also have a, what we call a confidence interval. Uh, you, can put, you can use a 90, 90 percent or 95 percent confidence in about that the score that you confident oh 90th or 95th uh 95 or 90 percent confidence interval and confidence interval yeah and that is um it's basically a range that indicates that the person's iq um would not fall out of that um that range by chance. So we're just trying to take that range sort of gives you a, you know, where we expect if she was assessed again and again, where that variation would probably dance around in that range. And with a 72, um, if the intervals were presented, you'd probably have on the low side, obviously falling below the 70 and the high side being a little higher. Mm -hmm. um, so um, why is is Ms. Holden's IQ important to your understanding of, of Nate? Well, um, the role of parenting is uh, extremely uh, complex, is extremely difficult, and um, one of the things that um, the intellectual developmental uh, disorder accounts for is a person's uh, adaptive functioning. And um, one of the things that a person who falls below um, that range is considered to have significant deficits in adaptive functioning, and that is the ability to sort of cope with and deal with and adapt to sort of life's variations. And when you add a child to the mix, much less three, you have a lot of adaptive um, uh, functioning that we expect most adults to have and to be able to engage in. And folks who don't have those will sometimes engage in um, less than ideal ways of coping with life. And this, uh, a, a, a score of, of 72 or 65 or 85, uh, none of that would mean that Ms. Holden wasn't loving towards her children, right? No, not at all. Yeah. Um, I mean, and she could, care for, she could care for her children. Yes, to the best of her capacity. Mm -hmm. um, is, was there anything in those records that you read which, um, which indicated that, uh, that there was some some reason that the test was or the scores were considered to be questionable, something about the spread between the, the verbal IQ and the performance IQ? Uh, yes. Um, so when you have um, a spread of more than uh, 15 points, and this one was 20, uh, we consider that spread to be significant. And um, as a general practice in the field, sort of as a best case scenario, the, the IQ score then becomes sort of problematic because um, you don't want to have inflation or deflation ba uh, based on um, the variation in the scores. Mm -hmm. So what's common practice is to accept the verbal IQ when you have those splits as the um, most likely indicator of a person's IQ. I see. Okay. So is it, is it that when you have a large split between the verbal IQ and the performance IQ that you don't 
that the the full scale IQ doesn't mean much under it gets weighted different yeah because of its um, it gets so let's say uh, her verbal IQ was 95 and her or 85 and her performance IQ was 65 um, the depression of that 65 in the performance of the nonverbal side we try to take into account that to, that they may not capture uh, accurately uh, the person's full capacity and because the performance is the nonverbal item sort of like doing the puzzles and putting different pieces together um, but the verbal uh, requires a lot of reasoning requires a lot of word knowledge it requires uh, a good deal of, of uh, understanding um, how things relate to one another and that's why we give more weight to the verbal when we have those splits and that's accepted typically as a greater indicator of the IQ. Okay, thank you. So uh, also uh, continuing on the subject of, of Antoinette, Nate's mother, um, you, you mentioned a few minutes ago that you thought uh, parental substance abuse and addiction was, was an important factor for Nate. Yeah. Um, are you speaking about his mother's alcoholism and drug addiction? Well, you know, from it appears that alcohol and drug ran pretty rampant uh, for his in his family of origin. But um, most critically, was hers in the sense that it appears that she did have a an alcohol use problem as well as a, an addiction to crack cocaine. Mm -hmm. Would um, would you use the term alcoholic to refer to her? Um, yeah, you know, it, it is. As a clinician, we don't typically refer to people as alcoholics, um, but um, but more in line with saying that a person is suffering from alcoholism. Mm -hmm. yeah. I see. So, uh, so al al the term alcoholism is not a clinical term. Right. That's more of a popular term. That's correct. And and uh, clinicians would use alcohol use disorder. Is that alcohol right? use disorder. I yeah. see. Okay. And would you say, based on your understanding of her? Uh, alcohol consumption that she would would meet the criteria for al alcohol use disorder yes uh, and how did that affect Nate um, children of alcoholics um, you know unfortunately are uh, often parentified uh, especially when they enter into adolescence and what, what I mean by that is that they um, are not typically able to totally depend on the parent that is uh, suffering from alcoholism to uh, provide a lot of the care and they wind up becoming providers of care themselves and and, and Nate in many ways um, became um, you know per parentified in more than just kind of a symbolic manner he actually became a parent uh, during those adolescence adolescent years which is um, not uncommon uh, it's, are there are there other ways that alcoholism affected this family? Um, well, it, it led to uh, a great deal of instability, even though Nate did indicate that his, uh, his mother tended to hold a job regularly and she worked. But, um, but the alcohol uh, consumption was related to some of the violence that was there and, um, and also the instability in the, in the family with regards to not knowing whether this period of alcohol consumption is going to erupt into a um, a battle of violence between his parents. Mm -hmm. um, so you said that uh, that Antoinette, we just heard some testimony. You were in the courtroom for the family member testimony, right? Um, we've heard some testimony about Antoinette um, holding down a job and, and mm -hmm. taking care of three children. Um, are, are those things inconsistent with either her intellectual uh, cognitive problems or with alcoholism? You know, I think that uh, when we think about it stereotypically, it may seem uh, incon inconsistent, but there are, you know, numerous, numerous, numerous people who hold down jobs and, and are active in families uh, while they are uh, engaged in uh, excessive alcohol consumption. And so that's not... Um, and it's all based on what type of job, right? I mean, um, so, and we, there's a term for people who actually, you know, wake up, drink alcohol, and go to work, and it's called functional alcoholism, right? That's another popular term for, for that, but that does not sort of negate uh, the, the sort of 
to the the, the deleterious effect the 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 diminishing capacity of a person providing care. And when we talk about provide care, that's also something we have to qualify because not all care is, um, is at times sufficient. Mm -hmm. Well, right, I mean, the, the care that parents provide uh, has many facets, right? It's, right. Not, it's more, more than simply putting food on the table and, and getting the children out the door to school, right? That's correct. And are there and does does alcoholism in, impair a parent's ability to to parent on sort of a higher level than that? So we, you know, um, I don't know what kind of food was placed on the table. We know that all all food placed on the table is not good food, and um, but I'm going to assume, given that he's survived uh, you know, his formative years and in, into adulthood, assume it was enough. Assume he was closed well enough. Uh, um, he did attend school and, and um, seem to function there really well. And, but what, what it doesn't provide is uh, a model for how to um, live as an adult partner in a family and how do you um, provide love and care um, without um, being inebriated? How do you provide, how, how do you engage partnership uh, as parents and how do you um, so care is not just the, uh, so th there's the basic, right, needs of care, but then when we begin to talk about more higher order care, um, watching uh, alcoholic and violent parents provides a, uh, it negates sort of that basic level of care in my opinion. Well, and let's, let's go on to, because you've mentioned it a couple of times, the, the violence in the home, which we also heard about this morning from, from some family members. Um, first of all, I think you already used the term transgenerational violence. What do you mean by that? I mean, uh, what I mean by that is, um, you know, Nate's grandparents having a violent relationship, and then that um, d being delivered down to his uh, parental relationship, uh, yeah, his parents' relationship. And then that eventually being delivered down into his own. Mm -hmm. So what, what is your understanding of the violence that occurred in this home? What did that look like generally? Um, my understanding was, was that it uh, occurred between his, uh, his mother and father and that um, it was frequent, it was regular, it was bloody, it was violent, uh, it re resulted in um, people's faces disfigured, his, his mother's face disfigured, his dad being attacked. Um, and growing up in an, in an environment like that leaves you uh, very uncertain and very uh, incapable, in my opinion, to uh, adequately grow into a person who's going to be able to um, sort of break the cycle, if you will, of that sort of uh, dynamic without the, the correct intervention. In your uh, expert opinion, how severe was the level of domestic violence in this home? Well, given that uh, the domestic violence uh, permeated this home from as early as they could remember until um, his parents uh, split when he was much older, I consider that a um, to the highest level of significance uh, because that repeated uh, exposure to violence between his parents, uh, it changes the, uh, and we know that kids who are exposed to uh, chronic violence uh, the, in their, in their uh, families of origin, we know it changes their, uh, their brain development. It, it recalibrates uh, their sensitivity to, um, to violence and to aggressive acts. It, um, and it makes it very hard for them to be well and high functioning adults. What significance do you place on, um, on the testimony we heard about Nate seeking to break up the fights? Unfortunately, that's not uncommon for children to want to intervene and uh, cry and scream and try to show their parents that what they're doing is, is harming them. And, um, Unfortunately, those environments will typically uh, respond with a sort of telling the child that it doesn't have anything to them, that they should just calm down, move out of the way, and you wind up having um, a person developing a, you know, a really um, 
in a sorry developing in a very chaotic environment that they have no capacity to uh, control and they have and it's also highly unpredictable mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and does that is that is is Nate trying to break up the fights is that related to what you talked about earlier about par parentification right so you have uh, you know for most kids the parents are the executives of the home and uh, if the parents are doing it well um, the kids can depend on the parents to uh, you know manage their affairs as well as manage the home and provide them some sort of safety and 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 uh, you know regularity now does that mean parents don't disagree and have you know conflict no but how they deal with that conflict is critical for modeling to even the children of how you deal with the conflict how do you deal with that socially how do you deal with that when you become an adult and you're the executive of a home and um you know for what he uh, experienced um it removes the parents from being sort of in control and being the executives of the home to now this kids in there trying to control the out of control people we heard about how um nate would nate and his, his siblings uh that there might be a fight the night before they uh they might have heard the heard their parents fighting or nate may have even been involved and then the next morning maybe get up and go to school yeah. is uh does that does that surprise you that that could happen no not at all and it's um you know children have different uh dispositions and so you may have a kid who is living in that and they go to school and they be and they're very disruptive and very chaotic um so they wind up bringing the uh, domestic violence sort of dynamic <laughs> with them but uh, way more often what you're going to have is a kid who will go to school, probably be pretty quiet, um, probably not cause a whole lot of problems. And, you know, for, uh, for Nate, I mean, his, just his disposition, even when talking to him even now, um, is, is rather, is a pretty calm one. <clears throat> so I'm not surprised he went to school and, and, you know, managed to, to do well there. Um, that was his, that was this place of stability. The adults were adults at school. The teachers weren't going to break out into a violent act. Mm -hmm. So school may have been a safe, safer place than his home. Is that what you're saying? School is definitely a, a safer and more stable place than home. Um, and uh, I'm going to show you some more records here. May I approach, Your Honor? Yes. <laughs> I'm going to hand you um, Defense Exhibit S14. Have you seen those before? Yes. And what are those? These are public school records for Nate. And so those are Nate's school records. Um, <coughs> did you did you learn anything significant in there? Nate did did pretty pretty good in school, and the teachers liked him. Um, some of the comments, wonderful, you're a great student to have. Uh, those things were, you know, uh, pretty evident, I mean, pretty consistent in his record. And he graduated from high school. Yes. And, and, and again, uh, that, that doesn't mean that he wasn't affected by what was going on in his home, does it? No, and that doesn't mean his grades were all A's and B's. I mean, there were F's in there and, and other things, um, and that just... Um, you know, and it, I mean, even in subsequent semesters. So, you know, when when attentive parents see something like that, usually we intervene and try to see what's going on and try to help our kid perform academically better. Um, <clears throat> but uh, so just judging from the record, he did have difficulty in various places in his academic record, but the commentary from the teachers was that he was a good good kid. So uh, we just talked about the, the violence in the home. Um, in addition to that, was there uh, was there infidelity? Yes, and uh, that his father had um, children outside of the marriage and uh, outside of the relationship. I guess it wasn't a marriage, but yes. Um, <coughs> how did that affect Nate? 
you know, Nate accepted um, his siblings as his siblings. Um, and I think the understanding was that that his dad, um, you know, would have relationships with, with other people. But um, as far as that, that's just being another part of uh, the cocktail of having a family of great instability and having the, the uh, uh, executive system be sort of dysfunctional. What do you mean by that was the executive system? What I mean by executive system, when I use that term, I'm, I'm talking about parents and the family, the people who are supposed to be managing and running the home, and the the infidelity and the bringing in the additional children and mom, you know, having to accept those kids and then raise them, you know, um, that's just a part of this whole, the dysfunction of the system. Mm -hmm. And you've said instability. Uh, were there other aspects to that instability other than the than the things we've talked about so far? Well, other than uh, eventually the relationship ended. So, um, I and mean the, the relationship between, between Nate's parents? Yes, between Nate's parents ended. And, um, you know, for a lot of domestic violence relationships, when those, when they end, they can actually provide a great relief for a family. And, um, but, you know, in this instance, it did not provide a great relief because uh, Nate and his siblings were left with a mother who was highly addicted to crack cocaine. Mm -hmm. And how, how did that affect Nate, his mother's it's, crack it's, addiction? Yeah, it's a, it's a further uh, part of that, that instability. And then I think uh, around, or at least somewhere around this time, it began to be sort of a shuffling of the children to um, uh, other relatives to who would step in and provide some of the care that they needed. Mm -hmm. Nate for a while lived with his aunt, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, obviously, we're we're here to discuss what happened on April 9th, twenty fourteen. Uh, why why is what we've talked about so far relevant to that? Well, you know, um, one of the things that individuals who uh, go through uh, this sort of formative experience um, and one of the things they try to do is to get out and one of the ways of getting out of that uh, the chaotic dysfunctional uh, environment is uh, through an attempt to have a normative bond with someone and uh, Nate at a, at a young age um, I think did that when he uh, met um, Latanya, who became his, his his girlfriend and then his wife, because her family represented the ultimate stability for him. Uh, you have a two-parent fa home. Mm -hmm. You have a uh, parents who are religious and uh, and who, by all accounts, had you know provided uh, not just basic level care, but some of those higher levels of care. Who acted as an executive system. And, you know, Nate sees that, Nate connects with it, and then um, sort of recapitulating his own um, parental dynamics, he winds up becoming an early parent also. And, but that all, but that for him allows him to sort of undo and, and do better and redo, uh, at least it gives him the opportunity for all of those things. So I think that um, the, why it's relevant is because you know you wind up coming out of uh, this family and you wind up attaching to this family that but but that is some place that feels like what you believe normal is mm -hmm. and your entire identity and everything gets caught up in that family mm -hmm. and uh, and it is uh, you still have your own obviously but uh, but this is this is home now this is my chance to be a part of something that is um, that is normal, that is stable, and but you see in there a re, uh, sort of a repetition of a lot of the same historical things of becoming an early parent. Uh, he indicated that his father-in-law didn't uh, particularly care for him as a partner for his daughter, and just as his um, grandfather didn't care for his dad as a partner to his mother. So uh, w without um, a, a an intervention that would have taught Nate how to break this, that would have allowed him also some cognitive restructuring, some, some recalibrating his thinking and ways of being. Um, I'm not sure that this relationship um, 
would have served as anything other than a place where he tried to get something restorative from his, for himself. And I think he absolutely loved his, his family. But, um, but this, this was not a, um, you know, this, the, way that he, the way that he attached to it, in my opinion, was sort of an, a reaction to his own history in addition to being a teenager in love. How how did um, how did what happened what what Nate experienced in his childhood the violence and the addiction how did that impact his ability to cope with difficult situations? Um, so f from my time talking to Nate and trying to gather a sense of how he's dealt with that even just gathering a sense of how he's you know dealt with being incarcerated for the time prior to this um, Nate minimizes. Um, a lot of what he feels and, exp and has experienced, and that's a that's a pretty classic way uh, that children of domestic violence and substance abuse and all sort of cope with life. We sort of do this kind of internal suppression. I consider it a like if you can if you take a container and um, you know life events goes into that container. And we just kind of pushed them down and pushed them down for an extended period of time. So he is not a, um, when I would go talk to him, even when he was upset, uh, uh, it wouldn't be explosive anger. It wouldn't be blowing up and walking out. I mean, um, and he may, um, he definitely would want to get his, his point heard and, and he had his perspective on things. But, um, but growing up in that environment, it, doesn't model for you or teach you how to effectively cope with your own hurt and pain. That's where we get that old saying, hurt people hurt people from, because we know that without the correct amount of in intervention, you just don't, you don't, you don't learn how to effectively deal with life's hard stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And have, um, th that, uh, you're saying that, 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 tendency to, to stuff things into the container, mm -hmm. um, stuff difficult things into the container, that that started in childhood, but has it persisted into Nate's adulthood? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Are there particular emotions that he has trouble dealing with or expressing? Um, I would say uh, hurt and anger. Um, so we, we heard about uh, the violence that Nate ex um, witnessed as a child, um, and, and do you, would you consider that experience of seeing his his mother beaten, seeing his parents fighting, would you consider that to be trauma? Yes, it is trauma. Why? Why is that trauma? Seeing someone else hurt. Um, well, I mean, we know that there are different types of trauma. So it's direct trauma. That means that you yourself were uh, the victim of something that was you know, harmful or could have been fatal or otherwise to you, causing it could cause you significant harm. But uh, vicarious trauma is is um, when you're watching someone else harmed, especially when you care about them and you love them. And um, but being there during a a violent episode is direct trauma. And in addition to the violence that he witnessed and the vicarious trauma there uh, in his family, did Nate experience other traumas in his life before April 9th, 2014? Yes. Um, living with an alcoholic, drug addicted parent is traumatic. Um, it's, it's, it's a hard thing to witness living with uh, a, um, a parent who uh, also is a threat of violence even when that person might not uh, beat your mom today that person is still a, a threat of violence so um we call sort of some a lot of when we have a lot of these sort of uh un childhood things all present the instability is is, is trauma right the um the breaking up of the family even though this family was highly dysfunctional you still feel you feel it when it when it ends when when his dad wound up left leaving uh, because it was the only family he had up to that point and so uh, we call these complex traumas and the reason why they call that is just because there are a, a myriad of factors that go into sort of shaping the early development of um, of a person.
And we've heard that Nate experienced a couple of assaults, uh, one yeah. when he was a teenager and one as an adult. Um, are those are those additional traumas that he's experienced? Yeah, and one he mentioned um, <clears throat> being hit in the head, I guess, during uh, during that event. And um, but anytime you're robbed and beaten or any of that, that's it's traumatic. I mean, you don't uh, and that. Uh. Um, I'm gonna. Uh, Show you another set of records here. Uh, may I approach your honor? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so those are just the 2009 records. Okay. Seven, nine, and ten, maybe. Is it, is it from 2007? Dr. Blackshear, I'm showing you what's marked as Defendant's Exhibit S15. Have you seen these records before? Yes. And what are those? These are um, early year medical records for, uh, wait a minute, no, not early. Yeah, these are several years back medical records for Nate, uh, so 2010. <coughs> And do those records um, include records of, of the assault that he experienced in 2009? Oh, thank you. Assault about four people with a gun and beaten with a gun. And he was, was he injured in this? Um, they indicated that he had multiple abrasions on his shoulder. Uh, and I think we saw earlier yeah, yeah. today some photos of his face being, being yeah, injured. Yeah. Yeah. The yes, there was that? a swelling uh, surrounding the left eye and, um, and the temporal area of his head. Yeah. Um, so, uh, have you diagnosed Nate with any mental health disorders? Uh, I did. Um, Nate, uh, I diagnosed with uh, chronic post-traumatic stress disorder. And what is uh, post-traumatic stress disorder? Uh, post-traumatic stress disorder is simply a uh, psychological uh, disorder that results from a uh, history of either acute or chronic trauma, and it, it impacts a person's um, functioning in the world, uh, the way that they engage others socially and otherwise, and it also impacts their cogn cognitions how they think about things, and it also uh, can impact sort of how they relate and um, uh, and especially and, and express to one, to others. But it also impacts their own uh, functioning, um, sort of emotionally and and otherwise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What uh, so post post traumatic stress disorder? The name of it implies that it's based on a uh, a trauma. Right. Yes. Uh, what is what is the trauma that caused Nate's post traumatic stress disorder? Nate's uh, traumas are the cluster of traumas that he experienced across his uh, life, um, growing up in a domestic violence home, um, parental and uh, function dysfunctioning, and uh, the instability within that home. His mother's uh, lack of adaptive functioning her alcohol uh, use disorder and her crack cocaine addiction. Um, his uh, family uh, breaking up, the dissolution of that relationship, and um, you add on things that we like to call community violence, and those are 
uh, violent, uh, you know, traumas that people encounter as a result of uh, where they live and and all. And that would be the the um, robberies and the uh, and the beatings. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what uh, in in making a diagnosis, uh, do you? Uh, do you look to specific criteria that someone needs to meet in order to, for that diagnosis to qualify? I do, and I use the uh, DSM-5, uh, the Di Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, DSM-5, that's put out by the American uh, Psychiatric Association. Mm -hmm. and, and tell us more about what the DSM-5 is. It's the, uh, basically the um, set of criteria that are listed for clinicians and medical doctors to uh, use in order to be able to diagnose uh, an individual. And from that diagnosis, we wind up using a myriad of treatment to uh, sort of uh, help a person um, get better from whatever they're diagnosed with. So it's, it's our, you know, it's the clinical Bible for psychologists, basically. It's just what we use to, to, um, to make diagnoses. Okay. So, um so what I'd like you to do is sort of take us through how you arrived at that diagnosis for Nate. Let's break for lunch and resume at 2.30. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'll go ahead and break for our lunch recess, resume at 2.30. Please recall all the instructions. Don't talk about this case among yourselves or with anyone else. Don't form or express opinions about the outcome, no media or independent investigation into these matters and no conversations with parties, witnesses or lawyers. Leave your notepads in your chairs, gather in the deliberation room at 2.30. Everyone else, please remain seated.